Welcome to Noir Factory Interrogation. Today, we'll be talking with author Dan Slayton. Dan is a former legal affairs reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and he's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Atlantic, GQ, and Vast Company. He's the author of Love in the Time of Algorithms, and most recently, Wolf Boys, Two American Teenagers and America's Most Powerful Drug Cartel. Dan, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thanks for having me on, Steve. I appreciate it. I was very taken with Wolf Boys. I found it to be a very compelling and intimate look at the almost every man's sort of kid that Gabriel, the main Wolf Boy, was. But at the same time, you managed to pull back the curtain on his circumstance. And in a wider scope, the whole war on drugs. I want to go deep with this. As a writer and a journalist, you've covered a number of society's facets. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but the story of two young men in Texas becoming killers for a Mexican drug cartel doesn't seem to fall right into your wheelhouse. How did you come to know about Bart and Gabriel, and what was it about their story that called to you? Well, I think when you 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 sort of line Wolf Boys up against my first book, Love in the Time of Algorithms, which is a book about the online dating business, it certainly seems like my interests are all over the place. I think, though, that Wolf Boys is probably more in line with um, my interests and my past probably than the online dating book was, only because I come from a legal background. I was an attorney. I went to law school um, and, and, you know, before I went to the Wall Street Journal and started reporting on legal affairs. So I've done a lot of reporting in the courtrooms, and um, I've, I've dealt with defendants a little bit uh, as a lawyer. So, you know, the crime reporting is, is probably more in line with my background. Uh, but, but yeah, the way that the way I, I, I found this uh, particular story was actually through a piece in the New York Times I saw back in 2009. Um, it was an article in the, that, that, that appeared in the, uh, the national section of the newspaper about these American teenagers who had become essentially assassins for hire for a big Mexican drug cartel called the Zetas, uh, which at that time uh, uh, there was not much known about this organization, at least up in the sort of northern areas of the country. If you lived down on the border or were a reporter on the border, then you probably knew uh, more about the Zetas. Surely you knew more about the Zetas than, uh, than, say, a legal reporter at the Wall Street Journal working in New York. But it was one of those stories that you read and you just don't forget about. It was very scary. One of the scariest stories I'd read, the idea that these boys had been essentially turned into uh, – the sort of robotic assassins um, for for an organization that was known to be incredibly brutal and violent. And so all these questions sort of flooded my mind, you know, where where do the kids come from? What sorts of lives do they live before they join the cartel? Um, what what is their daily life like? Uh, um what is the training like? Uh, what sorts of women date them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those, those were the questions that kind of sent me on my way. You mentioned that training and organization of the Zetas. From what we've read in your book, the Zetas do seem like a well-organized machine, almost as if they are what most businesses aspire to be. They're definitely a very organized group. They might have been more organized during the period that I'm writing about than they are now, which is sort of the nature of these organizations is that they rise and fall. And uh, as they fall, uh, the nature of the fall tends to be sort of, you know, a splintering um, and a disorganization as these various power vacuums will inevitably open up and uh, factions attempt to try to fill them and end up fighting against each other. Um, so the drug cartels are constantly kind of, uh, rising, falling, splitting up, fighting against each other, reforming. Uh, but certainly it's a very organized group. It's tightly intertwined with the government, uh, because of the nature of corruption in Mexico and because of the nature of corruption here in the States. Um, and one of the things that I was really fascinated, uh, to learn about and also sort of horrified to learn about was the extent of the organization, the way that it almost does mimic a, you know, a company, 
uh, or even a Fortune 500 company, the way that it has accountants, and there's different accountants for different regions, and there are different accountants for different of the cartels, you know, um, products from the cocaine to the marijuana to the illegal immigrants to the weapons smuggling. Each of these uh, has a various accountant. Each of these has a different boss that oversees the business, and there are various levels within the cartel that the lower uh, men and women attempt to uh, attempt to rise through. Um, so part part of the goal of the book Wolf Boys, uh, as I am telling the story of these boys who become assassins, I'm trying to also show um, the way that, that that they and others may attempt to rise to the organization and, and where you might want to go or where you might want to try to go within the organization after you, for instance, become an assassin. They certainly do seem to be well diversified. They also seem to be, at least at the time of your writing, room for upward advancement in their group. Well, yeah, there were, uh, you know, you started off as a lookout out on the streets in a Mexican city uh, looking for um, maybe informants, looking for the police to come, or at least the police who are not on the payroll, and then you reported that back. Um, and some of the lookouts worked on the corners, on the sidewalks. Some of them literally sat in windows. Um, and then there were the foot soldiers. There were the assassins. And those are the boys that I'm writing about. Uh, and then above that, you have sort of the plaza managers and the sub managers. And then you have the regional bosses and the national bosses. Uh, like I said earlier, you have the accountants. Uh, so it is, it is a vast, vast organization. And, and the Zetas, uh, the Zetas worked with the Gulf Cartel, which is the cartel that sort of spawned the Zetas. And, and at one point around the time I'm writing about in 2006, there were uh, allegedly about 10,000 employees. So you can see that this is uh, like a mid, you know, um, average mid-sized company. The story of the two boys presents us with an intimate look into a very foreign life. But at the same time, the lives the boys lead are parallels to the lives we could lead. One of the biggest examples of these mirror lives are Gabriel and the police officer Robert. Are they products of their circumstance, or is there more to it than that? I don't know that I have a totally satisfying answer, but I think that circumstance uh, did play an enormous role in the development of these two different people and these two different characters. One uh, becomes a teenage assassin for a drug cartel, and the other, even though he arguably comes from much less even than Gabriel did, uh, Robert becomes, you know, a cop and a DEA agent and then finally a homicide detective. And uh, so one of one of the goals for me in the book uh, was to try to dive into those circumstances and those family dynamics. Where do these people come from? Um, Gabriel, who is the criminal um, ironically, for, for the Mexican drug cartel, is an American kid. The American becomes the Mexican cartel crook. And Robert, who was born in Mexico and immigrated to the States with his family when he was nine, he becomes the cop. Uh, so I think that that subverts a lot of people's expectations about how, uh, you know, the criminal scene on the border works. And certainly that was very fascinating to me to show in a story. Um, because it doesn't necessarily mean expectations. But I think that, you know, Robert Robert had the family life, and Robert had the support of his father, uh, even though they came from very, very little. And Gabriel plainly did not, and, and certainly that played uh, played a big role in how they each turned out in life, um, whatever whatever other biological circumstances may have, may have affected as well. I believe that both Gabriel and Robert have their own safety mechanisms in their lives. At least growing up. Gabriel has his mother, uh, Lagabe, I believe. Yes, yes, Lagabe, Lagabe, uh-huh. But she also works for 16 hours a day and has much less of an impact on her son's life. Well, she's a single mother. She's working 16 hours a day. She has these four sort of unruly sons. And she is raising them in a ghetto in Laredo that, that is literally right on the border and right next to the bridge that comes across and right next to I-35, which is this prize smuggling corridor. And so um, the ghetto area, which is called Lazteca, 
uh, is the oldest neighborhood in Laredo. And for the past 250 years, as long as it's been a neighborhood, it's been this smuggling hotbed. Um, and so it was it was interesting to me to kind of lay out that world of Las Teca and all the different sort of black market industries that exist within it and how a boy like Gabriel would be at a very young age pulled into these various worlds. So by the time that he's 14, 15, 16, he has experience in all of them. That seems to be the biggest issue out of this whole war on drugs. As you've said, Laredo is the biggest land port in the U.S., and millions go through the city, but very little of the money stays or impacts the city. Well, yeah, I mean, that's sort of the irony of Laredo is that uh, NAFTA really turned it into a commercial center. Um, something like 75% of Fortune 1000 companies uh, are somehow invested in the city, either through owning a warehouse or something like that. Uh, so much money flows through the city, so much business flows through the city, uh, something like 50 to 60,000 semi trucks a week go north through it. And yet none of that money or very little of that money actually stays in Laredo. So you wind up with this with this bizarre scenario uh, where you have Laredo as a commercial center as the biggest overland port in the U.S., and yet it remains one of the poorest cities in America place. And so you have a lot of very impoverished um communities in Laredo, not only in the neighborhood of Las Teca, where Gabriel's from, but in a dozen other neighborhoods that are similar to it, wanting wanting to fill the void, wanting to fill the demand and eager to uh, to do so. You do a great job of framing the story of the boys with a larger story of the war on drugs. While it's obvious that the war is not working for society, were you surprised at the level of futility that you were able to show us through your character Robert? I don't know that I was so I think maybe that was one of the the one of the less surprising aspects of the story for me because everything you read about the drug cartel world about the border about the drug trade about the history of the cartels um uh, futility that sort of futility of law enforcement is the, is the common thematic thread through it all. I mean I've I've rarely seen um rarely seen a movie or read a book about this world where law enforcement is depicted as sort of winning. There is no such thing as winning. Um, so there were certainly many parts of the book that surprised me, that shocked me. But I think that the futility of Roberts, um, the sort of, you know, the sort of futility he felt as a drug cop on the border was probably the least Surprising, although I did think that his life experience, the sort of arc he takes from being a young cop who's kind of very, very fervent and very enthusiastic about the war on drugs and, and then kind of uh, losing his innocence and becoming very cynical about it, I think it did neatly capture uh, the sort of average uh, border investigator's experience. Yes, you show us many different sides of Robert's journey as well as, as as a young cop, we can see how he would feel he was making a difference by busting a dealer or getting those drugs off the street. But further experience tells a different story. And again, that yeah, that is very typical of, of the average, you know, the average experience of the average, uh, you know, cop on, on the border. Because by nature, when you start as a cop, you start off on the street. Usually you're, you're on, you know, doing, doing the sort of, uh, you know, the street level arrests. Uh, picking people up for small amounts of heroin uh, and things like this, and and you take those people off the street. And so when you're looking at it, it it's sort of that local level. It's much easier to feel like you're having an impact. And then as you go up the chain, as you get more experience, uh, you start to do bigger investigations. And those investigations, by definition, start to take you outside of your little bubble, outside of your little city. And slowly and slowly, you get this national view on things. And you see that, wow, it seemed like when I made that little heroin arrest on the street corner that I was patrolling, it seemed like that was important. But in fact, 99% of the heroin that comes through the border gets through Laredo and goes up into the country. And, and um, you know, a federal agency like DEA can throw as many resources at, at, at the problem as it wants. But it's always going to be the case that uh, 95 or 99 percent of all the drugs that are smuggled smuggled across the border 
will ultimately reach reach a user far, far north of a place like Laredo. Yeah, I don't want to give away too much, but how are we able to connect with the people in the story and get them to trust you enough to open up to you? Well, I, I think, and I don't, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be too glib, but frankly, uh, I think that my newspaper journalism career falling apart had a big, <laughs> had played a played a very important role in the creation of a book like Wolf Boys because Wolf Boys. Well, yeah, exactly. It was an incredible opportunity when they fired me, uh, you know, because, you know, you don't it's I think when you read Wolf Boys, you, see, you, you know, you say, wow, there's a lot of work that went into this book and a lot of relationship building as a journalist needed to happen, as as you know, you say. Um, and it just was it was just a matter of time. It was a it was a it was a product of a lot of time spent. I think that Gabriel and I were communicating with each other and sending letters for about 10 months before I even sat down to start to write anything. And I was also during that time, uh, you know, establishing relationships with other people in the story, like some of the other wolf boys who are also in the prison system and Robert Garcia. I'd been to Laredo a couple of times. So I was, I had done about a year of kind of on the ground research with the characters, learning about their lives, learning about their worlds, before I even started to think about, okay, how do you structure a book around this? And so that's the kind of thing that really uh, flies in the face of what's happening in journalism right now, where it's all about get the next blog post out in five minutes. And where's our Trump story? You know, this was the opposite of this. This was, this was essentially me being at a point in my career where I'd walked away. I had just done the online dating book and that was okay. It came out and and, but it wasn't necessarily the book. It wasn't. It wasn't the sort of book I'd. I'd kind of always wanted to do. Um, the sort of book I'd always wanted to do was narrative nonfiction, like Friday Night Lights, and the kind of books that you know I was raised on. Um, and I got to the point in my career where I, th- I, you know, I just said, I don't care if I never publish anything again. All I care about is that the next thing I do is going to be great and it's going to seem really important to me. And so I kind of I just sort of stepped away from daily journalism. I stopped pitching pieces for a while. And all I was doing was reading a lot of commercial thrillers to sort of soak up the structure of a of a thriller. Even though I was going to do nonfiction, I thought that this was an opportunity to do something that was very novelistic. And so I wanted to soak up, you know, the structure of a of a of of a fictional thriller because I felt like I could apply that. Uh, and I was exchanging letters with Gabriel and the other wolf boys. I was talking to Robert on the phone once a week um, and just soaking all this stuff up in anticipation of some big sweeping thing. And I've seen it from all these angles at a period in time when it's all falling apart. The whole industry is going down the tubes. I mean, just ask anyone who works at a newspaper right now and they will tell you that. This model- what is a newspaper? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and they, 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 there are a few of them still, still exist. And there are people working at them. Um, but no, just, just the other day, I was speaking with a friend of mine who, uh, is a staff writer at the, uh, the Dallas Morning News. And he just was like, you know, every day, all we talk about is how this model can just not last. So, um, you know, that this was, this was, I guess, I guess Wolf Boys was kind of my answer to what's happening uh, um, a little bit or kind of a, um, a reaction to it. I found that narrative voice to be incredibly strong in your book. There are times when I welcome that break in the story because it lets me see different aspects of the whole story. They take me out of it long enough to keep it checked to remember that this isn't a novel, it's not fiction, and these aren't just characters, they're real people. Yeah, which is that's the greatest thing I can hear. I mean that I just and it, it, there was an opportunity to do that. There was an opportunity because I had the access and I had the time to spend and I was determined to spend the time. I mean, Gabriel and I exchanged at this point it's been more than a thousand pages of letters in addition to the several times I've visited him in the prison uh and this and 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 a few phone calls. We didn't do a lot of phone calls because He's in a he's in a segregated unit and, and he rarely has any phone privileges. But but so we did we did all this letter writing and so I mean letter letter writing is a very intimate form of communication and 
you know, to exchange that many letters between two people, like he, he, you know, he got to know me very well too. He could probably write a similar book, although a much less interesting book about my life. Um, and so that, that was a big help. And then on the, on the other side, I was very lucky to have a set of characters, um, leading with Robert Garcia, the kind of lead homicide detective, but also the U S attorney on El Moreno, uh, and, you know, a couple of uh, DEA agents who worked, who worked on it, uh, who were very open with me. Robert and his family were just incredibly open, um, N- nothing, nothing really to hide, nothing to be ashamed of. Um, I think they they felt, and I think rightly so, that they had lived and are living kind of typical American lives. Uh, Robert is an immigrant. Uh, his wife is from a military family in Arizona. They both served, uh, and in fact, they met each other in the army. Um, and uh, and. And that's another part of the story that makes it great. You present these people in full. Robert isn't just a hero character. He and his family have issues. I think when he meets his wife, she's already married. Yeah, his wife. His wife had been. Yep, yeah, uh, his uh, wife had been married very, very young, and she had like I think a two-year-old son when they met in the army. You know, Robert was probably twenty-one, and she was like twenty or something, and. Um, they started a relationship with each other as her marriage was kind of falling apart. But yet in the military, adultery is a crime. And so they had to confront that and deal with that. And fortunately, um, there were there weren't any charges brought against either of them for that. They didn't get any discharges, uh, but they both you know retired from from the army. And then they decided to settle in Laredo. And uh, that's where they stayed over the years and the decades to come. Uh, and the interesting thing I think in the book is watching this very determined couple, uh, and fascinating couple try to raise their two sons. They then have a son with each other. So now they have, you know, two boys and they're trying to raise these boys in this town that is, that's a tough, tough town. You know, it's about a quarter million people. Uh, like I said, there's all the commerce that comes through it, yet it's very poor. There's a lot of drugs and the landscape for your average 13 year old is treacherous. Um, and so it was, it was fascinating for me to kind of watch Robert try to get these boys through the average junior high experience, um, through all their trials and tribulations and try to keep them on the straight and narrow. And, um, so Robert in a way becomes his father yeah yeah so there again he you know kind of benefited from the 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 strong father figure and i think he ultimately his own family benefited from him having married a woman who was very strong and very determined and had very firm ideas about how to raise a kid um and uh so you know it it was it was funny because when i when i started wolf boys um the reason that I embarked on the book was because I felt like I needed to know about the lives of these boys in Laredo who had become assassins for a drug cartel. I wanted to know where they came from. I wanted to know everything about their lives. Uh, and I envisioned kind of a thrillerish type of a book. But in I, I at, at the outset, I never envisioned writing a book about parenting. Like that was the last thing on my mind. Now, in retrospect, it makes sense. But so. Yeah, so there's a there's a strong sort of parenting line. And now, of course, when we look back, yes, of course there's a parenting line because why does a kid become a cartel assassin? Well, maybe he could have had better parenting and guidance. Why does a kid in Laredo not become a drug smuggler? Well, maybe his, you know, his mom and dad work really hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, yes, now I look back on it, of course it makes sense. Uh, but it sort of was one of those things that in the middle of the project, it struck me. I was like, wow, this is really funny. This is almost a parenting book. Again, not wanting to give anything away, you do get a chance to connect with the characters in their life. For example, Bart is kind of a wild card. Bart is a wild card, yeah. Bart was much harder to nail down um, than Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, I think had a lot more insight into his life and to what he had done uh, and, and why perhaps he became what he became. I don't think Bart was capable of that, of that sort of insight. And I don't, 
I, I'm not a doctor and, and I don't, I don't have a, a, I don't have a diagnosis um, for why that is, but um, you know, if, if, if we're sort of talking about sociopathy or psychopathy, I think that Bart sort of more um, obviously fell into one of those categories uh, than Gabriel did. How was Gabriel able to process his life and where does he stand with his past deeds today? Well, I'd say a couple of things about that. First of all, one of the challenges for me in the book is that I'm portraying a boy whose life effectively ended when he was 19 and a half. That was when he was arrested for the final time, you know, for good. Basically, he goes away to prison. Um, and I started talking to him. I first met him, I think, when he was 27, and then we communicated um, for the book for about three years. So he was about 10 years out side of that experience by the time we met him. So I, when I, when I was writing the story of his life and writing him as a character at, at, at 11 or 15 or 18 or 19, it was important not to sneak, um, his ability to reflect now into that mindset. And I don't know if I said that well enough, but I wanted to portray him as he was at 18 like now I can, I'm, I'm 39. I can look back on my 18 year old self with a lot of perspective. Oh, that's what was going on. Oh, it was a family issue that I was reacting to. I was, I was, you know, trying not to be my father or whatever, but at the time I didn't know that. And so it was important not to sneak too much perspective into the former self. So I was always, I was always attempting to kind of walk that line. Um, but I do think that he has a fair amount of perspective now on, on his life and on what, on the things he did. And he said to me in, in one of his most recent letters, uh, uh, shortly before the book was published. And this was after the book was already finished. Uh, he said, you know, my, you know, like, so yeah, I think he said something effective, the crimes, uh, I've done are atrocious. And that was something he'd never said to me before. And maybe I should have asked him more, been been more upfront about that. Like, how do you feel about what you did? Um, how do you feel that the state of Texas just thinks of you as a serial murderer? Um, but he said that. He said that on his own. Um, and and the reason I bring that up is because a lot of people ask me, well, is he remorseful? What kind of remorse does he feel? I think uh, the way it is in the book is his remorse is somewhat ambiguous um, because I'm trying to depict an earlier person. I think you do the story a great service by presenting it this way. Otherwise, you're just looking back over the events instead of reacting to them. Right. Right. And I think it's just less, it's sort of less interesting. I mean, people want to watch a 17 year old. People want to read about a 19 year old. But it's, I think it's less interesting to read about the 30 year old reflecting on, on the 19 year old self. But when, when I get to the epilogue at the end, I, then there is more reflection. And then I, then that to me, that was the place to kind of give his, his sort of modern take or the current, the current take on, on, on himself. I understand that Wolf Boys was banned in the Texas state prison system. What can you tell us about that? Yes, it was actually banned by the Texas state prison system before it even came out. <laughs> and that's where the story could do the most good. Now, were you given any reason for this? Well, it's it was unclear why it was banned. I mean, I think it's probably because um, some mailroom officer decided that they don't like Gabriel or, or, or decided that, that, uh, it, you know, just, they didn't feel it was right for an inmate to have a book about him. Uh, I mean, the Texas state prison system has this very aggressive book banning program. Uh, books, books are banned by, by, by literally by the mailroom officers, um, who may or may not have a high school degree. And there are six different grounds on which they can ban a book. And all of those grounds are very, very broad. Uh, the ground they cited for banning wolf boys was that it contains information about a criminal scheme. And the, the lines they cited were, um, it was one or two lines, uh, about a third of the way into the book, where I talk about one of the characters in the book who's, who's a very big smuggler. And I talk about how he would outfit the vehicles he bought 
to make them most effective for smuggling. Uh, and it's like a sentence or two, basically just saying that you pack the drugs in the part of the car where the car will retain its hollow sound when you slap the outside of it, when you slap the body. Because when you go through, uh, you know, when you come across the bridge or you go through a border patrol um, point, one of the agents often goes around the car and sort of just slaps it, you know, to see to see if it sounds like it's full in a place where it shouldn't be. So this is like. It's not even smuggling 101. I mean, this isn't. This is not. This is not a how-to guide to smuggle. But obviously, someone wanted to ban the book, and they started reading it. And this was the first place they got to where they felt that they had, uh, you know, a sort of reason under their own regime. Uh, one thing that was surprising to me is that they needed to read 120 pages before finding a reason to ban it. Uh, but, but, but. Uh, you should consider that a compliment. Yeah. Yeah, so so the so the book was banned before it came out, and um, and uh, there's just it's just one of those things that's unfortunate. There's nothing you can do about it. But yes, as you say, uh, some of the people who could probably benefit from the book the most are in the Texas prison system, having lived a life very similar to Gabriel and the Wolf Boys. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, unless someone smuggles a book into the prison system, they're not going to be able to read it. Until, until they get out, if they ever get out. Now, Dan, can you share with us what you're interested in today? What, what is, what's captured your interest now? Right now, I am working on, uh, on a magazine article that involves crime within the military. Um, and that is going to run soon. Uh, and I'm also starting another book, which involves crime in a religious subgroup. Um, and, uh, so that will be similar in South to Wolf Boys. It'll be narrative nonfiction. Um, and basically what I'm doing now with all these projects is sort of looking at people on the margins of American society and trying to understand why their lives ultimately turn to the criminal world. Um, so this is, this is things captured my interest at, at the, uh, the moment. And I will continue to read a lot of Richard Price novels and a lot of uh, a lot of crime fiction and thrillers. And I'll try to bring that sensibility to my nonfiction. Dan, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us today. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and share a link to your book in our show notes. Uh, where can our audiences look for you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at by Dan Slater. Dan, again, I found Wolf Boys to be an engaging, eye-opening book, and I can't recommend it enough. Thank you so very much for talking with us. Thanks so much, Steve. That means so much to me. Thank you so much for reading it and for taking the time to talk to me. And uh, hopefully there's going to be a movie version uh, relatively soon with Antoine Fuqua uh, directing. So if you want to swing back and talk about the movie in a year or two, if you still keep it in mind. That's it for this Noir Factory interrogation. Join us again next week as we take a hard look at noir, true crime, and hard-boiled fiction. Good night.